40 years ago when I was in university, I was a history major and uh, did a lot of business history. And so the idea of a historical framework within which to understand the electrotech revolution really appeals to me. And that's a big part of the report that has come out from Ember Energy. Uh, Dan Walter, uh, we're going to have a conversation about this. Dan, there are four or five sort of historical eras uh, that you've divided up in terms of how humans have used energy. Why don't you go over that for us? So there's the major zoomed out version, which is that we started as humans as foragers. Um, we then got a big leap in energy productivity as we became farmers. That is about a 100x increase in energy access. Then, of course, 250 years ago, another major leap happened with fossil fuels in the start of the industrial revolution. It's another 50x, 100x in energy access. And now today we have access to this new generation of technologies, electrotech, the age of vo photovoltaics, where we have another 100x jump that is coming. And if we look a little bit more recently, we see there's just a series of revolutions that have taken place, technology revolutions that have taken place since the industrial revolution. So we have coal coming into the system. Then we get the age of steams, steam and rail and of electricity coming in and, and steel. Then we get the age of oil and gas and mass production that really booms production globally. Then we have the digital age that, that, that has come after. And now we say we're in this, this next stage where we, we're, we're going to move towards the system of electrotech that is powering uh, the world. So you can take different framings of exactly how sort of how big this is in historical uh, context. But it's very clear that this is another step up in a larger historical trend of humans getting access to more and more energy. Um, <clears throat> there, within uh, our audience, uh, there are a lot of folks who are very worried about climate change. And I don't want to minimize that. Uh, <clears throat> but here at Energy uh, Media, we don't talk about climate much. We focus on the energy side of it and, and focus on electrotech and the challenges with uh, uh, oil and gas. Uh, but I want to make a point, which is that I'm prepared to concede the argument that fossil fuels were a giant step forward in human civilization. I'm quite prepared to do that. But by the same token, the exact same process of technology change over time and uh, ch the change in the way we, we produce energy and the way we consume energy, we put it to work for us. That's the, it, then electrotech becomes the next logical leap forward for, for humans. And so rather than demonizing fossil fuels, the question becomes how quickly can we get, make the leap to electrotech? Would you agree or disagree? I would, I would uh, on the whole, agree. Um, fossil fuels were, of course, unlocking the power of fossil fuels uh, made modern civilization what it is to a large extent. And so we, we came up with these great inventions from 1750 to, I would say, 1950, I mean, up to today, to some extent, to unlock this energy and actually, you know, improve lives for everyone around the world significantly. But as with previous sort of transitions and revolutions, at some point, a certain generation of technologies, this is just tapped out. And you can see this with fossil fuels in, in many ways, is Fossil fuels, for instance, enabled us to make a huge leap in energy productivity. Energy productivity used to be quite low, like only a conversion of about 10 to 15 percent of the energy that we actually harvested out of this uh, system went into useful energy. Fossil fuels boosted that tremendously. So our system became much more productive and energy use led to much more wealth creation, much more efficient society. But we're kind of reached the thermodynamic limits of fossil fuels right now. We can't make it much more productive. We can't make, squeeze much more out of a barrel of oil than we do right now. So this is a generation of technologies that has kind of maxed out. And now this new generation is coming in, not based on thermodynamics, but based on electrodynamics. And that is coming in and it's actually showing that already, even though we're nowhere close to being tapped out on this technology, it's already competitive with the fossil alternative. And that should be a reason for excitement for us all, because we have a new generation of technologies that are showing us right now, as we speak over the past couple of years, has truly shown us that it can be cheaper, more efficient and more secure than the incumbent, or, uh, incumbent technology generation. Um, and that's why we should get very excited about the revolution that we are in right now. And th this is a warning for the West, I think, if we view it in the right through the right lens. 
And that is, you think back to, you know, James Watt and the steam engine that kicked off the Industrial Revolution, and that became, you know, Britain dominated that and became a, an imperial power. Then we got, come along to the internal combustion engine and, and petroleum, and the United States uh, dominated that, particularly after, after World War II. And now we see with the electrotech revolution, China is dominating that, is dominating both the manufacture of that technology and its, its deployment, and it's using it as part of its geopolitical strategy to advance itself as a rival to the United States at the global level. Well, if, if new tech, energy technologies uh, birthed the uh, British Empire and then led to its downfall as it birthed the American Empire, one might conclude that the American Empire is now on it, you know, ready for decline, and Canada is 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 uh, bolted to the side of it. So we we would suffer as well as we see China and Asia become the new empire fueled by electrotech. And is that a useful way to think about this? I think so to some extent. I uh, so I, I live in the U.S. myself, and I think one of the miracles of the United States is actually it's sort of at its at its country level, not even at the business level, but at its country level, its ability to disrupt itself. So America has been incredibly good at catching on to whatever the next big thing is. I mean, it's in this city here in New York where I am that the electricity revolution began uh, over 100 years ago with the war of the currents. And, and this was just opportunity that American investors and innovators saw and jumped on. The same, of course, refining what happened in America. The digital age over the past couple of decades have be, has been so America-led. And every time as America has been smart enough to realize, like, yes, we're, we are a country that are that is... Uh, horse-based, but we can also build trains. Yes, we're a country that's train-based, but we can also build cars. Yes, we're a country that, uh, you know, uh, thrives on commuting cars, but we can also build a digital revolution and 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 video conferencing and whatever. And so it's a it's a country that is willing to disrupt itself. And it's one of the I would say mysteries uh, in 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 modern history. I would say that a country that has such a strong track record of disrupting itself and putting new energy technologies and, and information technologies into its society and leading is seemingly blind to what I think is one of the major uh, technology revolutions unfolding in the world right now, which is this revolution of new electrotech. And um, it's, it's one of the things that we kind of find miraculous in the energy debate today and something that is really going wrong specifically in the debate in the United States is that somehow everyone is ready to accept that AI is exciting, digitization is exciting, and all the other trends that you see. But one of the biggest things that is happening in the world, the transition of our fundamental energy system, somehow it doesn't click enough here in this country uh, to really see that exponential uptake uh, uh, like, like we see in other regions in the world. Uh, I would argue that the Biden administration actually did recognize it. And I, I, I make that argument because I spent a lot of time reading speeches and, st and statements from people who were in the Biden administration. Gina Raimondo, who's the Secretary of uh, Co Commerce, Brian Dees, who headed up the Economic Advisory uh, Council. And they all talked about how the the uh, second year, first second year of the, the COVID-19 pandemic was pivotal because what it did is it showed them how vulnerable the United States economy was to China's supply chains. So they see China as their principal geopolitical rival. And, and in the event of, a, of some kind of conflict, diplomatic or military, whatever it is, that their argument was we can't be dependent upon our rivals' supply chains because then what do we do if uh, we can't get you know apart or whatever? And so they said we need to build, we need to catch up to China, and we need to build our own uh, you know EV plants and battery plants and and solar manufacturing facilities and what have you. And that really was behind the rise of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips Act and the Infrastructure Bill and and so on. And and the way I see this, uh, Dan, is to explain in part Donald Trump is he he allied himself with the incumbents, with the oil and gas industry, with the coal with the coal companies, with the even the uh, legacy automakers, and so on. 
that's he's allied himself and he's a pushback against that that the Biden's you know clean energy strategy electrotech uh, strategy now the question will become what happens after Trump is there an after Trump and and if it you know the U.S. returns to recognizing that it needs to uh, embrace clean energy and electrotech then it might catch up to China again. And I think that's the pivotal question. We don't know what the answer is going to be. Will it get its feet under it again and and be able to compete? I'm just curious what your take on that is. Well, I think if there's one big lesson in world history over the past 200 years is that never bet against America to bootstrap its way out of uh, out of uh, a, a tough situation. What is it again? I think it's a Churchill quote of uh, uh, America will do the right thing after I've done all the wrong things and found out that that, that, that wasn't the way to go. Uh, clearly a paraphrase here. Um, now, I, I, to be honest, I, I think that America still has a large role to play. And also, if we think about this electrotech revolution, um, let, let's think about the IT revolution for a second. Like, America squarely led the IT revolution, but it led the software side of this, right? The hardware side was squarely increasingly led also by China. Uh, if we talk about, friends, about energy or information security, all the laptops that we talk and all this stuff, all these chips, they don't come from the United States. They might be designed in the United States. They run software from the United States, but they, do, they are not per se made in the United States. And I think this is also a misconception of, of, of electrotech at the moment is that it, maybe it shouldn't matter to us so much of who makes these pieces of electrotech because the profit margins on a solar panel are just a few percent. It's the same as the profit margin on manufacturing a laptop. Those are not great profit margins. The margin lies in actually making, making the user experience great, is making the software, the connections, the, the, the balancing of the grid. That's where the real money is to be made. And American software and American uh, engineering, uh, um, software engineering, is still, I think, top, top notch. And there's still a huge role that especially American tech can play in this electrotech revolution by making sure that, yes, maybe the technology is manufactured in the same place that all of our iPhones got manufactured, but it's running on our software with our security guarantees, with our way of doing things. And there's a very big opportunity there, specifically sort of in this connect tech, as we call it, the connection between supply and demand of this electrotech system for America to play a role in. And I, I highlight America here. This holds for the West, I think, as a whole. But America, of course, and specifically California, uh, has been global leader here. Uh, I've interviewed you and your colleague Kingsmill Bond many times uh, about this process. And a point that the both of you have made that I think is very important is that this is a long race. And we're only really at the at the beginning of the race. And you can see United States, you can see Europe beginning to gear up to, to uh, while China may have a lead, to catch China. They, they are quite prepared. They're not conceding defeat yet, and they are prepared to, to run this race over the long term. And if you look at it from that perspective, it's quite likely that you know, Donald Trump and his energy dominance doctrine and his support for, for fossil fuels is really just a blip on that timeline. Don't concede. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think it's another interesting lesson from uh, uh, the great frameworks of Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma, where he talks about the, this is a very fascinating, I think it's the first or second chapter where he talks about the rapid turnover in huge companies that make disk drives. So you get multinational companies that make the 14-inch disk drive and they all get competed out of business by the 8-inch disk drive. And lo and behold, it happens again with five inches and smaller and smaller. And every time new companies rise, everyone's very enthusiastic. They make a lot of money and then they fall because they fail to understand the next level of innovation. And this is happening in electrotech as well. Take, take batteries, for instance, uh, the, the, the NMC batteries, the batteries are, that we're now calling by now a little bit sort of the old generation, the old guard of very energy dense batteries that Europe and the United States went all in on. Uh, they're now being replaced by these LFP batteries, like the lithium iron phosphate batteries coming out of China primarily. Why? Not because this technology is more energy dense, but because it's just cheaper and good enough. And what we're seeing happening right now is, of course, another generation of sodium batteries coming in. And again, not as energy dense, maybe other issues, but they are, have the promise of becoming cheaper and being good enough. 
And so you get this rapid succession of technology generations where you could very easily see coming in between as a country, a company in the West or anywhere else in the world outside of China and actually leveraging the next wave of innovation and making sure to pull that to your country. I think it's what we're seeing happening, for instance, in India at the moment, right? And so it is silly, I think, to now say, oh, China's won this. Let's give up. That's like saying with the disk drive industry, oh, someone created the eight inch disk drive. This is it. These will be the behemoths for the rest of the digital era. No, five years later, they were all bankrupt and there were a whole new generation. And this can happen in energy and electrotech as well. You do need to be ready, of course. You do need to invest in new applications and new ways of doing things such that when this new generation of technology comes, the entrance sits, sits in your country and not again in China. So it's one of the dangerous things of being too optimistic sort of about China or too rose colored about how Chinese innovation works is that people get this idea of, oh, they're just running away with everything. I don't think that is fair. We can compete. We just need to want to compete, not compete on where the puck is today, right? Not compete on where they are today, but compete on where the puck is going, where the technology frontier will be tomorrow. And if we do that, I don't see any reason why by 2035, we can't have a manufacturing powerhouse in the West on batteries, on solar and other technology. As a uh, Canadian hockey player, I am legally obligated to point out that the where the puck is going metaphor came from the father of the weight, great Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> I love the metaphor. So uh, thank you, Canada, for your great uh, inspirations. <laughs> Dan, uh, another fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Markham.